Good morning. Welcome to the June 2018 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please introduce our agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear eight items for your consideration. First, you will consider a third report and order, memorandum opinion and order, and third, further notice of proposed rulemaking that would continue efforts to make available millimeter wave spectrum in bands at or above 24 gigahertz for fifth generation wireless internet of things and other advanced spectrum based services. Second, you will consider a second report and order that will remove barriers to infrastructure investment and promote broadband deployment. Third, you will consider an order granting forbearance from applying universal service fund contribution requirements to rural carriers broadband internet access transmission services. Fourth, you will consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes taking further steps in reforming intercarrier compensation for 8YY calls. Fifth, you will consider a declaratory ruling and notice of proposed rulemaking that will clarify the Commission's rules regarding toll-free texting. Sixth, you will consider a report and order to protect consumers from slamming, that's the unauthorized change of a consumer's telephone provider, and cramming, the placement of unauthorized charges on a consumer's telephone bill, including rules to address sales call misrepresentations and abuses of third-party verification procedures. Seventh, you will consider a report and order, declaratory ruling, further notice of proposed rulemaking, and notice of inquiry to adopt measures and seek comment on others to ensure that internet protocol captioned telephone service remains sustainable for people with hearing loss who need it. Eighth, you will consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking that tentatively concludes that the commission should vacate its 2000 least access order and invites comment on ways to modernize the existing least access rules. This is your agenda for today. Please note items four, five, six, and 12 as previously listed in the commission's notice of Thursday, May 31st, 2018 have been adopted by the commission and deleted from the <coughs> list of items scheduled for consideration. The first item today, entitled Use of Spectrum Bands Above 24 Gigahertz for Mobile Radio Services, Amendment of Parts 1, 22, 24, 27, 74, 80, 90, 95, and 101 to establish uniform license renewal, discontinuance of operation, and geographic partitioning and spectrum disaggregation rules and policies for certain wireless radio services will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunic Telecommunications Bureau, the International Bureau, and the Office of Engineering Technology. And Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And before I turn it over to uh, Chief uh, Stockdale for his presentation, I did want to note that this is a relatively full room. And as much as I would like to think, it is because of the deep public interest in reforms to our least access rules and toll-free numbers. I understand that there are a number of interns from Capitol Hill who are joining us to witness our proceedings. So those of you who are in the audience who are uh, joining us uh, today from the Hill, uh, welcome. We hope you enjoy uh, the presentations to be given. And you can see how the sausage is made in front of us, and uh, as well, uh, we appreciate your interest in uh, all aspects of things Washington. So welcome to the FCC. Uh, with that, uh, Chief Stockdale, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I am pleased to present to you the Spectrum Frontiers Third Report and Order, Memorandum Opinion and Order, and Third Further Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. I am joined at the table today by Joel Tobinblatt, Blaise Sinto, John Schauble, and Tim Hilfiger, all of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Julius Knapp and Michael Ha of the Office of Engineering and Technology, and Jose Albuquerque of the International Bureau. In addition to the staff at the table, I would like to thank the Commission staff listed on the slide for their input. Tim will now present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. 
The Spectrum Frontier's third report in order, memorandum opinion in order, and third further notice of proposed rulemaking presented for your consideration today continues the Commission's efforts to facilitate access to millimeter wave spectrum for 5G deployment and other uses. The third report in order would take several actions to refine the rules applicable to frequency bands made available in prior Spectrum Frontier's orders. As an alternate means for millimeter wave licenses to meet performance requirements, the item would adopt a geographic area-based performance metric which may be suitable to measure uh, <coughs> Internet of Thing deployments. It would also adopt an operability requirement for the 24 gigahertz band. Any mobile or transportable equipment capable of operating on any frequency in the 24 gigahertz band must be capable of operating on all frequencies in that band. In addition, the item would provide additional flexibility for fixed satellite services in the 24.75 to 25.25 gigahertz band without unduly limiting terrestrial use of the band. Further, it would license the lower 37 gigahertz band as six 100 megahertz channels. Finally, the item would eliminate the pre-auction spectrum holding limit for the 28 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and 39 gigahertz bands, and would establish a post-auction case-by-case review applicable to all millimeter wave bands licensed under the Commission's flexible terrestrial wireless rules. The memorandum opinion and order would deny petitions for reconsideration that ask for geographic area licensing in the lower 37 gigahertz band and for a satellite allocation to the 42 gigahertz band. The, fir the third further notice of proposed rulemaking also would seek on making ad available additional millimeter wave spectrum bands. In particular, it would seek comment on establishing flexible wireless service rules for the 42 gigahertz band pursuant to the Mobile Now Act and for the 26, giga, gig, 26 gigahertz band, which has received significant interest internationally as a 5G band. For the lower 37 gigahertz band, the item would seek to develop in greater detail a licensing mechanism that accommodates spectrum used by federal and non-federal entities. Further, the item would seek comment on allowing a limited number of individually licensed satellite earth stations in the 50.4 to 51.4 gigahertz band where a satellite allocation already exists with minimal impact on possible future terrestrial operations. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, and the International Bureau recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilferger, for that presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I must apologize in advance. I have a little under the weather. So if I sound worse than normal, it's for that reason. <laughs> Not that normal is any good, but it is what it is. <laughs> As I've often stated, it is of utmost importance that the Commission release sufficient spectrum resources to develop and deploy next generation technologies and to maintain the U.S.'s leadership position in wireless technologies. That's why I'm so pleased for today's item. I thank the Chairman for his continued efforts to move this proceeding forward, meeting not only his commitment to me to move the item, especially in uh, summer month starting with the letter J, <laughs> but also for including the 26 gigahertz in the further notice. Moreover, by resolving the outstanding issues surrounding 24 gigahertz, we have cleared the final per policy hurdles in front of conducting an auction, enabling us to move forward as the chairman announced. Additionally, we rightfully take steps to bring our consideration of 37 gigahertz ban to conclusion so this spectrum can be included in future auction. In this vein, I am hopeful we can set a specific timeline for upcoming, upcoming auction soon and that they will include the highly anticipated 37 gigahertz auction and the remaining 39 gigahertz licenses. As the Commission considers spectrum opportunities in both the mid and millimeter wave bands, it is important to provide interested parties with sufficient time to prepare for these auctions. There are, however, some sections of the item that cause me concern. In particular, I believe that the Commission should have reconsidered its prior decision to adopt the non-exclusive sharing in the lower 37 gigahertz band. In addition, I am also concerned by the suggestion in the further notice that federal operations could expand in the upper 37 gigahertz, even if such expansion is limited or on an as-needed basis. The federal government needs to reduce its spectrum footprint, not expand it. That is why I have stated, along with Commissioner Rosenworcel, that, our, that the value of current federal spectrum holdings should be appropriately quantified. 
I've gone even further, suggesting imposing agency spectrum fees or permitting agencies the ability to surrender spectrum for budgetary relief to facilitate the reallocation of unused federal spectrum to commercial uses. Finally, while I fully support not imposing a pre-auction spectrum cap, I am deeply troubled by the portions of the item that discuss post-auction and secondary market case-by-case -case spectrum aggregation review. As I stated last year, these spectrum screens should be eliminated. First and foremost, we continue to put more spectrum out in the marketplace. To date, we have made available 4,950 megahertz of licensed millimeter wave spectrum available. We've also inquired about adding the 26 gigahertz band, which includes more than two gigahertz of spectrum. And hopefully, we'll make, we will open other bands that have been teed up, like 30, 32 and 50 gigahertz. Altogether, this provides abundant opportunities for those seeking high band licenses, and of course, there's always unlicensed spectrum. Additionally, there is no evidence of the wireless industry ever warehousing spectrum, and in fact, the existence of such foreclosure behavior was clearly debunked during the 600 megahertz incentive auction experience. I was hoping that we'd finally put, this, put an end to this charade. Overall, however, I thank the chairman for his leadership on the issue, and I approve, and I will approve and concur in part. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thank you. America's main streets are getting 5G ready. You can see it on a walking tour of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where a local provider is installing 50 new small cells. You can see it outside Central High School in Woodstock, Virginia, where a new small cell is enabling a connected curriculum. And you can see it in the miles of new fiber and other high-speed deployments that are connecting everything from a family farm in rural Michigan to an after-school boxing gym in downtown Detroit. You can also see it 1,000 miles from here at a manufacturing plant in Iowa, where Sabre Industries is working to meet increased demand for its smart poles. The poles look like ordinary utility structures. Some are even visually identical to city trash cans. But within them are all the antennas and radios needed to support next-gen deployments. Sabre's 360,000 square foot plant is not a quiet place. The iron needed for these poles rolls into the facility on railroad trucks, railroad tracks, even better. <laughs> it's then run through a series of presses and welding stations before being galvanized or painted. Tyler, who's one of the 500 employees who works there, walked me through the process, and he says that production and demand for these new poles is on the rise. The good-paying jobs that small cell deployments are creating at plants like Sabres are part of a broader story about the economic opportunity that can come when we clear the way for next-gen deployments. But the FCC has work to do if we're going to win the race to 5G if we're going to extend these opportunities and deployments to communities across the country. We took a significant step in the right direction earlier this year when we cut about $1.6 billion from the federal regulatory costs associated with small cell deployments. By reducing red tape, we can flip the business case for thousands of communities, ones that otherwise might miss out on 5G. And we're currently looking at additional infrastructure reforms that can enable even greater deployments. On the spectrum side, we take another concrete step today in our effort to free up the high band spectrum that could help support next gen networks. We do this by finalizing rules for the 24 gigahertz band, by extending our bipartisan 2017 decision regarding mobile spectrum holdings to the 28 37 and 39 gigahertz bands. And we do this by seeking comment on opening up the 42 and 26 gigahertz bands. With respect to the lower 37 gigahertz band, I might have struck a different balance than the one the commission reached back in 2016. But recently, stakeholders have not shown significant interest in revisiting that decision. And overall, the item reaches the right result by promoting greater commercial access to millimeter wave spectrum so it has my support. Going forward, the Commission is going to keep up the work of identifying low, mid, and high band spectrum. And we're going to continue to remove unnecessary barriers to infrastructure deployment. I look forward to further progress on those issues. 
So thank you to the staff of the Wireless Bureau, International Bureau, OET, and OGC for your work on this item. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. If we want our 5G future to be bold, we have to acknowledge right here and now that the policies that made us successful in the past may not be the policies that lead to victory in the future. That's because if we want to be first to the future, we have to move past same old, same old spectrum policy and embrace new tools and techniques. In many ways, the actions we take today do just that. We take steps to clarify just how we will make available more high band spectrum for commercial use. We update our performance requirements to provide licensees with flexibility for innovative services beyond just the voice and data universe we know today to one custom built for the Internet of Things. That's important because this agency needs to recognize that 5G service is about so much more than smartphones. We also ensure operability in the 24 gigahertz band, preventing a future with the kind of device ecosystem problems we have seen in the past. In addition, we make clear that we will preserve a sharing framework in the 37 gigahertz band, and that's important for continued investment and innovation through new spectrum access models. But in other respects, I'm afraid today's action falls short. Specifically, the decision here to limit any pre-auction limits for high band spectrum and replace them all with post-auction case by case review, I think it misses the mark. And on this aspect of the decision, I dissent. Now to be fair, there may be reason to think that bright line pre-auction limits on millimeter wave spectrum are unnecessary given the real technical challenges of trying to bring this spectrum to market. I also recognize that striking the right balance is not easy at this early stage in the development of 5G service. However, as our national providers seek to grow bigger and fewer in number, it is important that we take steps now to avoid undue aggregation of spectrum in these new markets. This is not some radical notion. It has long been a bedrock of wireless policy. Moreover, it's an obligation this commission has under the law. In Section 309J, Congress charged us with avoiding excessive concentration of licenses by disseminating them among a wide variety of applicants. This principle becomes even more important when you consider that the FCC is timidly moving to auction millimeter wave bands one by one instead of boldly all together. It also has yet to put out a calendar that makes public just when additional airwaves will be made available. These are confusing signals to send to the market. We need to fix them. We need to be more thoughtful about how our auctions work because while our supply of high band spectrum is increasing, the list of potential bidders may be shrinking. We need to structure each and every one of our auctions going forward in a way that's designed to bring in different spectrum interests with new ideas that may not always look like the bidders of the past. After all, more participation is bound to yield a better auction and a brighter 5G future. Thank you, Commissioner. In order to bring 5G, the next generation of wireless connectivity to American consumers, we have to make available the spectrum necessary for new services to flourish. Like Will Ferrell and John C. Riley constructing their own bunk beds in the 2008 Cultural Milestone Step Brothers, our goal is to create so much space for so many activities. <laughs> to that end, today we are putting more spectrum on the table. Specifically, we propose to make available 2.75 gigahertz of spectrum across the 26 gigahertz and 42 gigahertz bands for flexible wireless use. I look forward to the record that develops and working with our federal partners to hopefully allocate the spectrum for more efficient uses. Moreover, we are continuing to make progress on the spectrum bands we've already targeted for innovative and new uses. For instance, we continue to push forward on putting the lower 37 gigahertz band to good use 
by establishing a band plan and asking questions about the appropriate coordination mechanisms for sharing with both federal and non-federal users. In that band, we have to work toward a licensing framework that preserves the band's viability for various potential users. We're also putting finishing touches on the rules for previously allocated flexible use bands in order to get ready for upcoming spectrum auctions. The operability requirement in the 24 gigahertz band, for example, will help potential users, both large and small, with competitive access and will ensure that no portion of the band gets left behind as equipment is developed. With respect to satellite, we take another positive step forward in the 50 gigahertz band by proposing fixed satellite service or FSS licensing rules similar to those in the 24 gigahertz band. While mobile use remains a work in progress for 50 gigahertz, we propose a framework to move forward with satellite operations in this band. Now put all of this together and you have an agency that remains hard at work to extend American leadership in 5G. This is the FCC's third report in order and third further notice of proposed rulemaking in three years relating to the millimeter wave bands in our Spectrum Frontiers proceeding. In our Spectrum Horizons proceeding, we have broken new ground above 95 gigahertz to explore the potential of ultra high bands. Critically, we are also pursuing infrastructure policies that are vital for densified 5G networks of the future. From updating our wireless infrastructure rules to encouraging the massive fiber deployments needed for wireless backhaul. And of course, we are actively planning for spectrum auctions starting this November. Many thanks to the staff who have led so many activities uh, to help the Commission achieve these goals. In particular, I would like to express my gratitude to all those who worked on today's item. Simon Banyai, Stephen Buenzo, Tim Hilfiger, Stephen Keegan, Charles Oliver, Matthew Pearl, John Schabel, Catherine Schroeder, Becky Schwartz, Blaise Sinto, Dana Schaefer, Don Stockdale, Joel Tabenblatt, Jeff Tigner, Janet Young, and Nancy Zazak from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, uh, Baman Badipur, Brian Butler, Martin Doskat, Michael Ha, Julie Knapp, Ed Mantiplay, Tim Mooring, T Tom Mooring, gosh, sorry, Nick Oros, Jameson Prime, Barbara Pavon, Karen Rackley, and Ann Ride from the Office of Engineering and Technology, and uh, Jose Albuquerque, Diane Garfield, Jennifer Gilsonen, Cal Krackhammer, Alyssa Roberts, Jim Schlichting, and Tom Sullivan from the International Bureau. And last but not least, David Horowitz, Bill Richardson, and Anjali Singh from the Office of General Counsel. This was an all hands on deck effort, very complicated one. We thank you for working collaboratively and constructively to get us to this point. With that, we will call for a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly. Approve in part and concur in part. Commissioner Carr. Uh, approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve in part, dissent in part. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the staff for the fantastic work. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you please take us to item number two on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the second item on your agenda, entitled Accelerating Wireline Broadband Deployment by Removing Barriers to Infrastructure Investment, will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, whenever your folks are ready, uh, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a second report in order on accelerating wireline broadband deployment by removing barriers to infrastructure investment. This order, if adopted, would further streamline the transition from legacy to next generation networks and services, eliminate unnecessary, burdensome, or redundant requirements, and help ensure that our rules take into account the challenges carriers face in the wake of catastrophic and unforeseen events. I would like to thank the entire WCB team for their hard work on this item. Seated at the table with me are Lisa Hone, Associate Bureau Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and from the Competition Policy Division, Terry Natoli, Deputy Division Chief, and Celia Lewis, Attorney Advisor. Celia will now present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. This second report in order continues the work of last November's wireline infrastructure item to remove regulatory barriers that increase costs or inject unnecessary delay when carriers seek to transition from legacy networks and services. 
by lowering barriers posed by our discontinuance and network change notification rules, the order, if adopted, would encourage deployment of next generation networks and services and help further close the digital divide. The second report in order further streamlines the Section 214A discontinuance process by first, reducing the comments and automatic grant timeframes for applications seeking to grandfather and then discontinue data services at speeds below download speeds of 25 megabits per second and upload speeds of three megabits per second, provided the carrier offers data services at or above 25 megabits per second down or three megabits per second up. Second, forbearing from applying section 214A and part 63 discontinuance requirements to services with no customers and no reasonable requests for service for the preceding 30 days. Third, eliminating unnecessary education and outreach requirements adopted in the 2016 Technology Transitions Order for carriers discontinuing legacy voice services. Fourth, providing an alternative to the 2016 adequate replacement tests for obtaining streamlined treatment of legacy voice service discontinuance applications. And finally, extending streamlined treatment to all applications to grandfather legacy voice services, building on last November's streamlining for applications to grandfather low speed voices services. The second report in order also further streamlines the network upgrade process by eliminating outdated and unnecessary notifications for network changes that impact customer premise equipment attachments and part 68 notices regarding incompatible terminal equipment and by facilitating rapid restoration of communications networks in the face of natural disasters and other unforeseen events. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis, and if I'm not mistaken, this is your first presentation at uh, an open meeting. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> well done, and uh, yeah, welcome to the table. Look forward to many more. Thank you, my pleasure. I will now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should have said in the last item that I was gonna submit a longer statement. I didn't, I uh, apologize for that. This one I have, that, well, it's, done. it's going in the record. You don't have to listen to it again, don't worry. <laughs> I have a, sh a short one for here though. Uh, this item makes logical and justifiable changes to simplify commission rules when providers seek to eliminate unused and underutilized slower and older telecommunication services. The imposition of unnecessary FCC hoops makes it more difficult and costly for providers to upgrade their networks, thereby depriving them of the ability to better serve current customers and expand their network footprints with faster and more capable systems. The changes adopted as part of this item are rather modest, will not harm consumers, and are worthy of our support. Consistent with where, I, with where and how fast I think the commission needs to go to match our regulatory burdens to market realities, I would be willing to go further than some of the lines we draw here. In particular, we appear to set up a questionable commission test as it relates to the discontinuance of voice service and the presence of sufficient voice service uh, and the presence of, excuse me, and the presence of sufficient standalone VoIP alternative offerings in the market. I suspect that we may have to revisit this issue in the future. Finally, I'm especially pleased that the item properly clarifies that our interpretation of the underlying statute, section 214 of the Communications Act, and our accompanying rules cannot be read to give the commission blanket authority to prevent the discontinuance of unregulated services. Someone will probably try to claim that this is an imaginary straw man that would never be presumed, but I debated commission leadership staff during the Wheeler regime who argued that any service discontinuance by a Title II carrier required FCC sign off. It was truly frightening conversation. Even when presented the hypothetical of a local telephone company seeking to discontinue an unrelated pizza delivery service, staff at the time explained that the company would need our approval. It was absurd then, and it's equally absurd now. Thankfully, we fixed that misinterpretation and potential overreach. I thank the chairman for bringing this item forward, and I will vote to approve. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. You might not think that the construction crew with Nebraska-based Bauer Underground 
is steeped in the FCC Section 214 and Part 51 case law. But they're big fans of the steps that we're taking here. Right now, they're working on Highway 22, which is a 20-mile stretch that connects Columbus with Genoa, Nebraska. When I visited with them last week, they told me about the trenching and construction work they're doing to replace slower speed legacy connections with a new fiber deployment. This will bring gigabit capacity to a portion of the Cornhusker state that has only eight residents per square mile. It will mean faster, more reliable broadband for over 900 households. At the FCC, we should be making it easier for providers to replace legacy offerings with these types of new high-speed services. After all, one of Bauer's crews can trench up to five miles of new fiber each day. But in the simplest cases, it can take the FCC months just to process the paperwork and green light the work. With today's decision, we cut that review time in half while ensuring that consumers will remain protected. This will help keep the construction crews moving. It will ensure that consumers get reliable and adequate replacement services and it will help provide communities like Genoa a fair shot at next-gen opportunity. So I want to thank the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau for its work on this item. It has my support. And Celia, I couldn't let this go by without calling you out. So 15 years ago, if you can believe this, she was a clerk and then paralegal in the Enforcement Bureau Spectrum Enforcement Division. I was an intern at the time in the Enforcement Bureau uh, many years ago. She subsequently left went to law school, is now back at the agency, thankfully. Uh, get your talent back, and as the commissioner, as the chairman noted, is presenting your first item, so congratulations to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carr, and hopefully you can give us the files on what uh, Commissioner Carr was like when he was fully <laughs> in his uh, bloom. Uh. What happens in the Enforcement Bureau stays in the Enforcement Bureau. That's not always accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I will just leave it there. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Rosenwurzel. Yeah. <laughs> I got nothing. Um, our networks are changing. Carriers are providing new services and faster speeds. Consumers are enjoying new ways to connect and communicate. It's important that we embrace this change because it's about more than technology. It's about using communications to expand opportunity for everyone across this country, no matter who they are or where they live. You know, that might be a lofty sentiment, but I think it's what this agency needs to do. Moreover, I believe it reflects our sacred duty under the law. Now, unfortunately, I believe too much in this decision falls short of that statutory mark, and let me explain why. When a carrier wants to make big changes to its network, this agency had in place policies to ensure no consumers were cut off from communications. In other words, leave no consumer behind. We had rules that required carriers to educate their customers about network alterations, and those rules simply required them to answer calls about how service might be changed when old facilities were swapped out for new. Today, the FCC guts these basic consumer protection policies, and tosses them out. It says we don't need them. So what does that mean? Imagine a grandmother living in a rural area. Her service provider wants to make big network changes because the cost of serving that remote area with traditional network technology now exceeds the revenues available. So that makes sense for the carrier. But for our grandmother, she just wants to know that her phone, her health monitor, and her alarm system, all of which rely on her current network, continue to work. She wants a heads up. She wants to be able to navigate this change and understand what will require a new contract. She wants information about what will involve a new service, and she wants to know at what cost. But today, the FCC says she doesn't need her carrier to provide her with this information. That's because she can check the FCC's daily digest and figure it out for herself. Who are we kidding? This is mean. 
It's not just mean to my fictional grandmother, it's mean to millions of Americans who will find that their carriers switch out services without advance notice or consumer education, leaving them scrambling to find alternatives and reconfigure their homes and businesses just to keep connected. It didn't have to be this way. I dissent. Now at the risk of being technocratic, I will approve one aspect of today's decision. I believe this order rightfully rejects calls that we entirely forbear from our statutory obligations under Section 214A. This is the correct call. By honoring this section of the statute, we acknowledge that providing service and opportunity to all is fundamental. So this discrete aspect of today's decision has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Why is my internet so slow? I don't like being stuck on DSL. There's a fiber line a few blocks away, but I'm still stuck on copper. I want some high-speed competition. Now, these are the core concerns that I have heard from consumers when I hit the road, and even this morning from someone in the mountainous part of North Carolina who is here in DC. I have heard them in big cities and small towns alike, from the deep south to the mountain west. One reason why these complaints persist is that regulations can make it difficult, if not impossible, to upgrade from the fading networks of yesterday to the high-speed networks of tomorrow. This FCC is changing that. Last November, we took steps to accelerate the transition to next-generation networks. Today, we do even more to modernize our rules. These reforms can free up billions of dollars which carriers can devote to building new networks instead of propping up old ones. This is especially important in rural America, where the business case for building broadband is often hard. The end result of all these efforts will be more rapid deployment, which means better, faster internet access and more competition for American consumers. Now, one example of a reform we adopt today is our decision to streamline the discontinuance process for low-speed data services if a carrier is already providing high-speed broadband, that is, at least 25 megabits per second. Now, this links regulatory relief to the provision of high-quality replacement services, which will both encourage the building of modern networks and ensure that consumers are protected. Another example is our decision to extend streamlined notice procedures for force majeure events to all network changes. And this will allow carriers to restore services as quickly as possible following events like hurricanes. As I have personally seen in Houston and Miami and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands following Hurricanes Irma and Maria, the top communications priority in the wake of disasters needs to be getting systems back up and running, not running a regulatory gauntlet. Yet another example is our decision to forbear from carriers having to jump through hoops to discontinue a service that nobody is using. Regulations like this offer literally no benefit. They simply impose costs. And this is precisely the kind of underbrush that we need to clear. And then there are the regulations that are a solution in search of a problem. The prior FCC adopted inflexible and burdensome outreach requirements. But companies have strong incentives to communicate with customers during a technology transition without such mandates. After all, carriers don't want to lose an existing customer having just invested in upgrading their networks. And the fact that the market is working without these burdensome mandates was proven, ironically, by these mandates' supporters. One party arguing to keep these mandates said they were responsible for a, quote, relatively smooth and seamless technology transition. And the only problem is that these requirements aren't even in effect. Carriers were working to inform customers without the mandate. And then there are the regulations that are like the party guest who still hangs around long after the music has stopped. For instance, we get rid of a rule requiring carriers to put on public notice the network changes that will affect the manner in which customer premises equipment is attached to the interstate network. Now, this all came from a bygone era when carriers often had equipment affiliates and the FCC was concerned that incumbents would use their transmission facilities to favor their own affiliates. Well, since then, the marketplace has dramatically changed and so too, the commission now decides, should our rules. I'd like to thank all the dedicated staff that contributed to making this result possible. 
from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Michelle Burlove, Megan Capasso, Lisa Hone, Dan Kahn, Celia Lewis, depending on how much information she gives us, <laughs> Pam Megna, Chris Monteith, and Terry Natoli. From the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Garnet Hanley and Catherine Matravis. From the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Susan Barr, Rosalind Crawford, Elliot Greenwald, and Suzanne Singleton. And from the Office of General Counsel, Valerie Hill, Billy Layton, and Rick Mallon. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Approve. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve in part, dissent in part. The chair votes aye. Uh, the item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the staff for the great presentation. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please announce item number three on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the third, fourth, and fifth items will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and introduced by Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau. Item three is entitled Petition of NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association and the United States Telecom Association for forbearance pursuant to 47 USC section 160C from application of contribution obligations on broadband internet access transmission services. Thank you, Madam Secretary. To the illustrious CAMO, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration an order that promotes broadband access in rural America by eliminating disparate financial burdens on certain rural broadband providers. I would like to thank the Telecommunications Access Policy Divisions, excuse me, Policy Division team for their work on this proceeding. Our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel also provided us with invaluable input. With me at the table are Ryan Palmer, Chief of the Telecommunications Access Policy Division, Karen Sprung, Assistant Division Chief, Suzanne Yellen, Assistant Division Chief of the Industry Analysis and Technology Division, and Ariel Roth, Legal Advisor. Ariel will now present the item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Access to broadband is critical to full participation in modern American life. Thus, the Commission's top priority is to improve digital access for all Americans, particularly those living in rural communities. However, current rules impose disparate financial burdens on certain rural broadband providers and in turn increase the cost of broadband for rural consumers. The Commission has consistently declined to impose universal service fund contribution obligations on broadband internet access services. Nonetheless, Small rural carriers that provide broadband internet access transmission services on a common carriage basis are uniquely required to contribute to the universal service fund on the revenues from those offerings. This regulatory asymmetry creates competitive distortions in the rural broadband market and perpetuates the digital divide. If adopted, this order would forbear from applying universal service fund contribution obligations to rural carriers broadband internet access transmission services, thereby eliminating discriminatory regulation of rural carriers and reducing the cost of broadband in rural America. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roth, and as with Ms. Lewis, I understand this is your first presentation as well. Uh, job well done, and uh, thanks for your work on the item. Thank you. I'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I support granting the petition. This item's most significant aspect is the Commission's unequivocal reaffirm reaffirmation, excuse me, that it does not impose fees on broadband internet access service. In other words, we don't tax the internet. As chair of the Federal State Joint Board on Universal Service, I'm occasionally asked whether the Commission would be willing to expand the base of USF contributions to include broadband users. Having studied the issue and worked for years on internet tax freedom enshrined in the permanent Internet Tax Freedom Act, I've made clear that expanding the contribution base is something I cannot entertain absent congressional direction. With this order, I hope that any lingering uncertainty regarding the Commission's willingness to consider new broadband fees has been put to rest, and instead, we can focus our attention on adopting an overall cap on USF. I will vote to approve, and I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner O'Reilly. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Plymouth County, Iowa has three times the number of gravel roads as paved ones. They pass farms and ranches where, right now, 
the green shoots of this year's grain crops are just starting to push through. A few miles down one of those gravel roads, next to a small family farm where there's literally no other structure within sight, I spent time with a small broadband provider as they were hard at work bringing fiber to the community. They were using a directional drill to bore underneath a creek that ran along the road. While it only took about 30 minutes to cover the 60 feet or so, the total cost of trenching fiber along just one mile of those roads can run as high as $30,000. That's a significant expense, considering that there's often just one residence per mile. The experience gave me a new appreciation for the hard, often gritty work that goes into bringing more broadband to more Americans. And it served as a reminder of the work we need to do at the Commission to eliminate the unnecessary regulatory burdens that make these deployments only more difficult for providers and ultimately more expensive for consumers. Today's order is another good step in that direction. By reducing the contributions obligation that raised costs for just one set of rural broadband providers, we're allowing them to compete on a more level playing field while also decreasing the costs that rural consumers pay for their broadband. In fact, this reform is expected to cut around five to $10 off a family's monthly bill for broadband. That might not sound a lot, like a lot by DC standards, but it can make the difference between a family being able to afford broadband or getting left on the wrong side of the digital divide. So I wanna thank the staff of the Wireline Bureau for your work on the item. I'm pleased to support it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Our high cost universal service fund program is designed to bring modern communications to rural America. And that's a noble goal. But the system we have to do so is not just complex, it's Byzantine. With the advance of time and technology, regulatory reforms have multiplied and as a result, there are real quirks and some strange inequities in our rules. Today, right here, we remedy one of them. We grant non-model rural incumbent local exchange carriers forbearance from the universal service contributions related to one component of broadband internet access service. You got that? <laughs> like I said, it's complicated. I concur in this decision. As a matter of equity, I think it's important to put these carriers on equal footing with their peers. But the analysis in this decision I find lacking. Moreover, while I think this is the right call today, I also believe it's time for some basic math. By granting this forbearance, we forego roughly $40 million in funding for broadband in rural America. Add to this the roughly 55 million in lost interest income that the FCC just gave up by shifting universal service bank accounts without even a vote, and you have nearly $100 million in universal service funds that have disappeared. So I don't just worry that our high cost universal service system is complicated. I worry that despite our noble rhetoric about closing the digital divide in rural America, we are draining this agency of the funds necessary to do so. Thank you, Commissioner. With today's order, we take another step toward closing the digital divide in rural America. The details, I concede, are wonky, but the result is straightforward. We are making broadband cheaper for many rural Americans. Over the years, the FCC consistently has declined to impose universal service fund contribution obligations on broadband internet access services. And under our current rules, one and only one class of broadband providers, rural carriers that offer certain broadband internet access transmission services, are required to contribute to the USF based on those offerings. In other words, these small carriers, which serve areas that already are among the most difficult to serve and expensive to serve, have to pay broadband taxes that their competitors don't. And these small pro providers in rural areas have no choice but to pass those taxes on to their rural customers, who as it is, tend to have less ability to pay than their urban counterparts. Well, today we end this discriminatory treatment. Specifically, we relieve rural carriers from having to pay USF taxes on their common carriage broadband internet access transmission services. 
and in the process, we lower the cost of broadband for their customers. Indeed, these consumers could see savings of $7 or more on their monthly bills for internet access. Now, this win for rural consumers wouldn't have been possible without the hard work of Commission staff. And I'd like to thank Claudia Fox, Trent Harkrader, Chris Monteith, Ryan Palmer, Ariel Roth, Karen Sprung, Suzanne Yellen of the Wireland Competition Bureau, as well as Melina Barzilai, Billy Layton, Rick Mallon, and Linda Oliver from the Office of General Counsel. We'll now proceed to a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Concur. Uh, the chair votes aye as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you, folks, for the work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you t please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fourth item by the Wireline Competition Bureau is entitled 8YY Access Charge Reform. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary and Ms. Monteith. Whenever the phalanx is ready to roll, we are. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a further notice of proposed rulemaking proposing to address abuses of the intercarrier compensation regime for toll-free calls, alternatively referred to as 8YY calls. If adopted, the MPRM would transition originating end office and tandem switching and transport charges for toll-free calls to bill and keep and cap database query charges for toll-free calls nationwide. The item was developed by the Wireline Competition Bureau with input from the Office of General Counsel and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. I would like to thank the entire team for their hard work on this item. Seated at the table with me are Lisa Hone, Associate Bureau Chief, and from WCB's Pricing Policy Division, Pam Arlock, Chief, Gil Strobel, Deputy Chief, Rhonda Leon, Attorney Advisor, Greg Capobianco, Attorney Advisor, and Irina Oskokov, attorney advisor. Irina will now present the item. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Building upon the reforms the Commission began in its 2011 USF ICC transformation order, the further notice proposes to move to bill and keep over a three-year period all originating interstate and intrastate end office and tandem switching and transport charges related to tall free calls. During the transition period, incumbent LEX would be required to reduce their rates by one third in the first year, by another third in the second year, and to bill and keep in the third year. The further notice proposes to allow originating carriers to recover their costs primarily through end user charges, although it seeks comments on, on allowing some recovery through the Connect America Fund. The further notice also proposes to cap 8YY database query rates nationwide and to prohibit the imposition of more than one database query per call, regardless of the number of carriers in the call path who perform queries. The Bureau recommends adoption of the further notice and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, this is your first presentation as well. Boy, this is great. Uh, uh, well done, and uh, thank you for the work on the item. I will now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, an early sentence in this item expresses the views of prior commissions on intercarrier compensation. It reads, in 2011, in the USF ICC transformation order, the commission adopted bill and keep as the ultimate end state for intercarrier compensation and recognized it as the best method to a uh, best way to rid the system of arbitrage and to provide the right incentives for efficient use of the nation's telephone system. I wholeheartedly agree. Our broken payment system generates a vicious snowball effect in many different facets of communications policy. Certainly, it generates arbitrage and traffic pumping. It also is the heart of why there was a rule call completion problem. It's part of the reason why there's a need for the rule rate floor, and it's keeping providers from making the best economic decisions for their companies and customers. Today, we take another step forward toward adopting the correct and sound policy objective of bill and keep as a replacement for all of the current flawed compensation schemes, particularly in the 8YY context. In my opinion, the whole 8YY dialing structure is on the way out, 
as consumers move in droves to other means of communication. But fixing it here will provide some immediate benefit and reaffirms the Commission's larger goal of moving towards universal bill and keep, albeit on a slower pace than is appropriate or necessary. So let's do the bigger lifts necessary on adopting bill and keep across the board with no carve outs and then move on just like the market is telling us to do on traditional voice telephony. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks to staff for the work on the item and for presenting it. Uh, I certainly support moving towards the direction with intercarrier compensation towards bill and keep and continuing to look for ways to combat possible arbitrage schemes. I think the further notice does that, so it has my support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. We've all been there on hold with a bank, an airline, or an insurance company. Sometimes there is canned music to pass the time and calm the nerves. Other times it's an unending cycle of pressing zero to try to speak to a live person only to get passed around from one customer service agent to another. The saving grace of this mess has long been the fact that these calls don't cost anything. That's because for decades, dialing 1-800 numbers has been free for consumers. But today, the FCC proposes changes that could put an end to free 1-800 numbers. So the next time you make one of these calls, congratulations, you could pay for the privilege. This is not right. Toll-free dialing has long been a creature of an arcane system of intercarrier compensation that's overseen by this agency. The defining feature of this system is that consumers can make calls from any phone at no charge. Behind the scenes, however, a complex web of payments make these free calls possible. And over time, this system has been the subject of gaming and abuse. Enterprising folks who want to exploit these payment flows have set up calling practices that create arbitrage revenue and give them the opportunity to split the profits. This is wasteful. It deserves to be fixed. But simply put, there needs to be a way to do so that doesn't saddle consumers with the cost. Rather than being clear about what is being proposed, this rulemaking is littered with industry jargon. It offers a discussion of the most obscure call flows and payment schemes and then coyly offers that moving to a model where the end user pays for 1-800 numbers will ultimately benefit consumers. I don't think so. While consumers on unlimited mobile plans may not immediately feel the pinch of this proposal, the rest of us who lack them certainly will. I dissent. Unwanted robocalls are the top source of consumer complaints we receive at the FCC. And they aren't just annoying. Scammers use robocalls to fleece many unsuspecting Americans out of their hard-earned money. These scams rightly get a lot of attention. But there's another, less obvious way that robocallers have been picking Americans' pockets. It turns out that they are taking advantage of the payment arrangements used to compensate various entities that are involved in delivering phone calls. It's a little complicated, but here is how it works. As detailed in an article just this week in the Wall Street Journal, robocallers form revenue sharing agreements with phone number dealers. When the robocaller dials a number that is purchased from a dealer, a caller ID database is queried, which triggers a string of payments. The first payment in the string is made by the telephone company serving the party that is called. A portion of that payment then goes to back to the number dealer, who finally shares the revenue with, you guessed it, the robocaller. So, more robocalls means more payments to the robocaller. And the called party doesn't even have to answer for the money to change hands. Since these payments are made by the called party's voice provider, its customers, that is, people like you and me, are ultimately paying for the privilege of receiving these robocalls. To quote Lucia's best from The Incredibles, that ain't right. And the AYY intercarrier compensation system similarly gives robocallers incentives to place calls for the sole purpose of generating originating access revenues. Under our current rules, when a robocaller places a call, the carrier it uses will be compensated for originating the call. 
And if the carrier has done a backroom deal with the robocaller, then the robocaller profits each and every time it makes a call. Unfortunately, the record shows that robocallers are abusing the 8YY intercarrier compensation system on a massive scale. One commenter, for example, explained that an auto dialer may, quote, hit the number key every 20 seconds, which can send an 8YY call into an endless loop, generating minute after minute of originating access charges for the originating local exchange carrier, which has partnered with the caller to share the revenue. In the end, these calls are paid for by anyone that operates an 8YY number, such as a small business or a nonprofit like the Red Cross. So this is uh, the latest step in our aggressive strategy against robocallers. To date, that strategy has included the largest fine ever imposed by this agency, updating our rules to address spoofing, encouraging a call authentication standard, and working with other agencies, both here and abroad. Today, we also attack the silent scam that robocallers use in the 8YY intercarrier compensation system. Ultimately, this will mean lower prices for consumers and fewer annoyances in our daily lives. Thank you for the staff who have diligently prepared today's notice. It has my full support, and we look forward to working with you on this and other tools to attack what Senator Hollings once called the scourge of civilization. And with that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? I dissent. Uh, the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the staff for the great work. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth and last item from the Wireline Competition Bureau is entitled Text Enabled Toll Free Numbers, Toll Free Service Access Code. Secretary, uh, Ms. Monteith, the floor is once again yours. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, as Marlene said, this will be our last item for the day. <laughs> <laughs> the Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration a declaratory rulemaking, excuse me, a declaratory ruling, a notice of proposed rulemaking that will clarify the Commission's rules regarding the authorization required to text enable a toll free number and propose and seek comment on further safeguards against the unauthorized text enabling of toll-free numbers. Many thanks to the entire Wireline Competition Bureau team for their hard work on this item. Thanks also to our colleagues in the Wireless Telecommunications and Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureaus and in the Office of General Counsel for their review and helpful feedback. Seated at the table from the Competition Policy Division are Ann Stevens, Deputy Chief, Heather Hendrickson, Assistant Chief, and Alex Espinoza, Attorney Advisor. Alex will now present the item. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, good afternoon. Good afternoon. The item before you seeks to modernize the administration of toll-free numbers by promoting the innovative use of these valuable numbers for text messaging purposes while protecting the integrity of the toll-free numbering system. First, the item's declaratory ruling clarifies that a messaging provider must obtain a toll-free subscriber's authorization before text enabling a toll-free number, and accordingly may not text enable an unassigned toll-free number. We also clarify that a messaging provider must disable toll-free texting should a toll-free subscriber revoke its authorization. By clarifying existing rules, we ensure consistency with our statutory responsibilities and protect the rights of toll-free number subscribers who often invest significant resources in building a brand in particular toll-free numbers. Second, the item's notice of proposed rule rulemaking, if adopted, seeks comment on how a toll-free subscri subscriber should make clear its authorization to toll, excuse me, to text enable a toll-free number. To ensure a toll-free subscriber has indeed authorized a toll-free number to be text enabled, we propose to require a toll-free subscriber to inform its RESPORG of that authorization and for the RESPORG to update the appropriate records in the toll-free SMS database. This proposal will ensure that there is a single authoritative registry to determine which toll-free numbers have been sex enabled by their subscribers. We also seek comment on what other information, if any, needs to be captured and centrally managed to protect the integrity of the toll-free numbering system, and whether such information should be captured in the SMS database or some other toll-free registry. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Espinoza, for the presentation. Uh, we'll now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner O'Reilly. I thank the chairman. 
as consumers have shifted from calling to texting, businesses have begun text enabling their toll-free numbers as another means to engage with their customers. The declaratory ruling clarifies that the subscriber, the business that holds a toll-free number, is the only entity that can authorize the text enabling of a number. I generally support the outcome, but want to make two points about the notice. First, it is not clear based on the present record that there's a problem that requires regulatory intervention. The notice points to a handful of instances where a number may have been text enabled without the subscriber's authorization, but those examples are contested. Therefore, the record generated in this proceeding will be valuable in assessing the need for commission action. If this is a hypothetical concern or a limited problem that could be addressed through industry best practices, then I'll be reluctant to want to expand or create number registries, which would impose new burdens on subscribers and costs on their users. Second, because the Commission has not classified text messaging, the notice is forced to explain how the administration of text-enabled toll-free numbers does not prejudge the regulatory status of text messaging services. I would like to end the regulatory tap dancing and take the affirmative step of declaring text messaging to be an interstate information service. To, to the extent consumers use SMS, it is typically part of an all-distance, unlimited bundle. Increasingly, however, consumers are opting out to use a wide range of over-the-top messaging apps. According to one report, just the combination of the apps Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp process 60 billion messages a day, three times more than SMS, and that was back in 2016. It makes no sense to begin placing antiquated regulatory burdens on a legacy service when consumers are already shifting to new forms of messaging that we have no authority to regulate. I hope the Commission will take this issue up in the near future. I will vote to approve, and I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, as my colleagues on the dais here know, my Saturday mornings are quite busy. Uh, after we go down to our local cable head end to peruse the channel lineups for the coming week, and we go by our local broadcast stations to make sure their licenses are in the windows, we send text messages to 1-800 providers to see which ones have been enabled. Um, but in all seriousness, I'm glad that we are uh, pushing forward with this item. Uh, it's going to help deter bad actors, hopefully, uh, unlike my kids, uh, from text enabling numbers for uh, purposes of fraudulent schemes. Uh, and it will sure ensure that toll free numbers keep their value uh, as businesses and community resources uh, and prevent consumer confusion. So I look forward to seeing the record as it develops. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. In the interest of moving us along, I will say thank you to the Bureau for its work, and I look forward to the record that develops. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, in a classic 2001 Thanksgiving episode of The West Wing, President Bartlett complains to Charlie about the absence of a hotline that you can call with questions about cooking turkey, <laughs> a special toll-free number where the phones are staffed by experts, as he put it. When Charlie informs the President that such a service already exists in the form of a butter by, the Butterball hotline, Bartlett rejoices. Well, 17 years after that episode, the Butterball hotline still answers over 100,000 turkey-related questions each holiday season. And life has gotten even better, at least from the fictitious president's perspective. Uh, Butterball has also enabled a toll-free phone number to receive and respond to texts. President Bartlett, as well as the Carr household, would be very proud indeed. Uh, the innovation of text-based turkey advice seems to suggest a growing trend toward toll-free text messaging. And this trend can be very consumer friendly. For instance, the retailer Land's End already allows customers to text its toll-free number, which many may prefer to the hold music that you typically get on a phone call. And toll-free texting can also help businesses become more efficient. For example, the company Call em All allows employers to text its workforce using toll-free numbers to manage schedules or to broadcast last-minute shift needs. With rapid developments in artificial intelligence, these text interactions will likely lead to better service for consumers and productivity gains for businesses. But there's a fly in the ointment. Uh, one person's number can become another person's platform. If a scofflaw can text enable a phone number without the knowledge or permission of the person who holds that number, the scofflaw could use that texting capability to perpetrate fraud, undermining public confidence in toll-free texting. So how do we solve that problem? Well, it's a simple free market solution more secure and better defined property rights. 
we need to make clear who can, and by implication who cannot, text enable a toll-free number. And that's exactly what this declaratory ruling does. We make absolutely clear that a toll-free subscriber and nobody else must authorize text enabling of a phone number. This is particularly important for toll-free toll subscribers using that number for voice calls. With that clear, the notice then seeks public input on what else, if anything, the FCC should do to promote a competitive and innovative market in text messaging services. Like my colleagues, I want to thank the staff that worked on this item and look forward to seeing it uh, uh, develop in the future. Uh, with that, we will call for a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. The chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thank you to the staff and adieu to the Wireline Competition Bureau. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you take us to item number six on the agenda? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the sixth item on your agenda will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau and is entitled Protecting Consumers from Unauthorized Carrier Changes and Related Unauthorized Charges. Patrick Weber, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Weber, whenever you and your team are ready, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today I am pleased to introduce an item that recommends steps to protect consumers from slamming the unauthorized charge, uh, the unauthorized change of a consumer's preferred telecommunications provider and cramming the placement of unauthorized charges on a consumer's telephone bill. Both are long-standing and continuing problems for consumers. The report and order before you recommends measures that will strengthen the Commission's ability to take action against slammers and crammers and deter them from slamming and cramming in the first place. I would like to thank the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau staff for their work on this proceeding. I would also like to thank the Office of General Counsel, the Enforcement Bureau, the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities for their contributions to this item. With me at the table are Kurt Schroeder, Chief of CGB's Consumer Policy Division, Nancy Stevenson, Deputy Chief of the Division, and Rebecca Herschel, Attorney Advisor in the Division. Rebecca will present the item. Good afternoon, Mr. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The report in order before you recommends measures to protect consumers from slamming and cramming by unscrupulous carriers. Slammers lie during telemarketing and verification calls while trying to lure consumers into a carrier switch they never wanted, often targeting vulnerable populations like the elderly and non-English speakers. Crammers steal from consumers by putting unauthorized charges on their telephone bills. The Commission has taken enforcement actions against slamming pursuant to general provisions of the Communications Act. But, this, but the item before you would strengthen our requirement to stop the slamming that remains. Specifically, this item adopts a rule to prohibit material misrepresentations on carrier telemarketing calls to consumers that often precede a carrier switch. But this rule would render any subsequent verification of a carrier change invalid if the sales call was based on a misrepresentation. In addition, this item ensures that slammers will pay the price when they abuse our verification safeguards to victimize customers. A new rule will prospectively suspend carriers from using the third party verification process for a period of five years after the commission takes forfeiture action against them. This item also improves carrier change verifications by eliminating the outdated requirement that carriers obtain the authorization for each distinct telecommunication service sold based on regulatory classifications that are outdated and unfamiliar to consumers, such as intralata toll and interlata toll services. Finally, the item codifies a prohibition against cramming. This rule prohibits carriers from placing or causing to be placed on any telephone bill charges that were not authorized by the consumer. We recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herschel. And if I'm not mistaken, is this your first time at the table? Or? Second. Second. It's been a while. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome back. Uh, we'll now turn to comments from the bench. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll submit my longer statement and just make one point. I'm exceptionally glad that we're finally going to examine 
how to best suspend carriers or revoke authorizations of bad actors that do not comply with our rules. I know it's something that Commissioner Carr has looked at, Commissioner Rosenbrussel has raised, my staff has raised a number of issues, a number of times. I think we counted somewhere close to a dozen. We tried to figure out how best to do this over the last number of years, and I'm thankful that your uh, staff has is adopted this as part of this item, and hopefully we'll figure out how best to do so. So I thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. There's no shortage of telemarketing scams. In fact, the FCC has warned Americans about one scheme in which callers try to hoax, coax victims into saying the word yes during a recorded call, including by asking them, can you hear me, at the beginning of the conversation. Scammers will then edit and stitch together the audio of that recorded call so it sounds like the victim has provided consent to some charge or other action. Often, those recordings are used to carry out two scams that we address today, slamming and cramming. Recently, we've seen an uptick in the type of slamming and cramming cases where fraudsters use those falsified recordings to carry out their scheme. So I'm glad that we are taking aggressive steps today to crack down on such practices. The rules we codify here will better position the commission to take action against carriers that engage in slamming and cramming, including through misrepresentation on sales calls. I also wanna thank my colleagues for agreeing to add language to the item, as Commissioner O'Reilly indicated and has also been working on, that reiterates the serious penalties the FCC can impose for violations of these rules, including the revocation of commission licenses. We owe it to consumers to use all of the tools at our disposal to deter these bad actors. I'm glad to support the order, and thank you to the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau for your work on the item. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Scam artists are awfully good at finding ways to cheat us on our phone bills. And slamming takes place when these fraudsters switch the carriers on our wired lines without our permission. Cramming occurs when consumers find light items on their bills for special services they did not order, do not want, and do not need. Let's call this what it is. It's digital age pickpocketing, and it needs to stop. Now, in recent years, the FCC has used its enforcement powers to go after these scam artists who try to rip off consumers with slamming and cramming schemes. We've levied millions of dollars in fines. We've also worked with carriers to secure millions of dollars in consumer refunds for those who have been the victims of these swindles and cheats. This is good. But you know what's better is instead of fixing these problems after they occur with fines and with refunds, we stop them before they happen. And that's why this decision is important. We codify our prohibition on cramming and we improve our rules involving slamming. In other words, we seek to stop these scams before they happen. This effort has my full support. Thank you, Commissioner. What's worse than getting a marketing call just as you're about to sit down for dinner with your family? Well, answering that call and having snippets of the conversation taken out of context to justify switching your telephone carrier without your consent or adding unwanted charges to your phone bill. If that's ever happened to you, then you were the victim of slamming or cramming, two egregious ways in which unscrupulous companies exploit unsuspecting consumers. Slamming involves changing a consumer's phone provider without his or her permission. Cramming occurs when unauthorized line items, uh, charges, are placed on a consumer's phone bill. In the past, the FCC has attacked slamming and cramming by interpreting Section 201B of the Communications Act, which prohibits unjust and unreasonable practices to forbid misrepresentation on sales calls and billing practices. Well, today we take even stronger measures to combat these practices. First, we adopt a specific rule to prohibit cramming. This is the first time in the agency's history that we've done so. Combined with our existing truth and billing rules, which help deter uh, and detect cramming, this new bright line rule will make clear to every wireline and wireless carrier what the law is and will enhance the FCC's enforcement efforts against cramming. Second, we adopt a rule that a subscriber's authorization to switch carriers will be deemed invalid if a material misrepresentation is made during a sales call. And the reason here is simple. Carriers should not be able to deceive consumers into switching providers. 
Third, we also streamline and strengthen the third-party verification process, or TPV, which involves a recorded conversation between an independent third-party verifier and a consumer about switching carriers. For example, no longer will, car will carriers selling more than one service be required to ask consumers if they want to switch individual services based on arcane regulatory classifications, like interlata or intralata calls, as Ms. Herschel pointed out, that are confusing to consumers and more outdated in today's market. We also take an important step to crack down on those carriers that abuse the TPV process, such as when a caller cuts and edits audio from a conversation with a consumer to create a fraudulent TPV purporting to be the consumer's approval to switch carriers. From now on, upon a finding that a carrier has abused the TPV process, that carrier will be suspended from using TPV as a means of verifying consumer switches for five years. And together, all of these changes will help ensure that the TPV process remains an effective tool for good actors, but is not misused by bad ones. As with many of our consumer protection initiatives, uh, this was a collaborative cross-agency approach. And so I want to thank uh, the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, the Enforcement Bureau, the Office of Com Communication Business Opportunities, the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, and the Wireline Competition Bureau for your efforts. We'll now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. The chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the staff. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the seventh item on your agenda will also be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau and is entitled Misuse of Internet Protocol, Captioned Telephone Service, Telecommunications Relay Services, and Speech-to-Speech -speech Services for Individuals with Hearing and Speech Disabilities. Again, Patrick Weber, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Weber, uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau also presents to you a report and order, declaratory ruling, further notice of proposed rulemaking, and notice of inquiry on Internet Protocol Captioned Telephone Service, or IPCTS. This item adopts measures and proposes others to ensure the continued viability of IPCTS for people with hearing loss who need it for effective telephone communication. I would like to thank the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau staff for their hard work on this proceeding. I would also like to thank the Office of Managing Director, the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, the Enforcement Bureau, and the Office of General Counsel for their contributions to this item. Joining me today at the table are Karen Pelt Strauss, Deputy Chief of CGB, and Bob Aldrich, CGB's front office legal advisor. Bob will present the item. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm pleased to present this report and order, declaratory ruling, further notice of proposed rulemaking, and notice of inquiry on Internet Protocol Caption Telephone Service, or IPCTS, a form of telecommunications relay service that allows individuals with hearing loss to both read captions and use their residual hearing to understand a telephone conversation. In recent years, IPCTS has quickly grown to represent almost 80% of the total minutes of, uh, compensated by the Interstate Telecommunications Relay Service Fund, or TRS Fund, at a cost of nearly $1 billion per year. As IPCTS usage continues to grow, and the contribution base supporting the TRS fund declines, potential waste in this program poses an ever-increasing threat to the continued viability of IPCTS and of all forms of TRS. This item, therefore, takes steps to ensure the sustainability of IPCTS for individuals with hearing loss who need it. If adopted, the report and order would set interim compensation rates for IPCTS providers for the next two years, moving those rates progressively toward the average cost of the service. This action would save the TRS fund nearly $400 million over the next two years. The report and order <clears throat> would also adopt rules to limit unnecessary use of IPCTS by requiring that consumers be able to use volume control on IPCTS devices without captions requiring notifications that help prevent inadvertent use, <coughs> excuse me, um, requiring notifications that help prevent inadvertent use of IPCTS and prohibiting the provision of IPCTS to ineligible users. 
The declaratory ruling would take a significant step towards modernizing IPCTS in light of recent technological advances in speech-to-text automation. Specifically, it would authorize IPCTS providers that comply with the Commission's mandatory minimum TRS standards to use fully automated speech recognition technology to generate captions on IPCTS calls without the involvement of a communications assistant. The further notice would seek comment on issues relating to funding, administration, and determining user eligibility for IPCTS. For example, in response to concerns that some carriers are shouldering a disproportionate share of the funding burden for IPCTS, which historically has been supported solely by interstate and international revenues, the further notice would propose to expand the IPCTS funding base to include contributions based on end user revenues from intrastate communications services. The further notice would also explore ways that state programs can participate in the administration of IPCTS and ways to curb provider practices that encourage the use of IPCTS by people who do not need it. Finally, the notice of inquiry would seek comment on IPCTS performance goals and service quality metrics. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aldrich. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. I thank the Chair. I will submit my longer statement, but I did want to uh, say that I'm going to approve in part and concur in part and mention one of my biggest concerns is the legal authority provided for expanding the base of TRS contributions and the options for implementing such an expansion. I worry about the direction of that, and we'll have to see how we go forward. So I thank the Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Commissioner Carter. Thanks. The FCC has an obligation to ensure that telecom services are available to Americans with hearing loss. One way we do that is through the funding of IPCTS, which is a service that allows an individual who can speak but who has difficulty hearing over the telephone to use a phone and an IP-enabled device to simultaneously listen and read captions of the phone conversation. The Commission's TRS fund, which subsidizes the cost of IPCTS, serves vitally important purposes. It helps ensure Americans with hearing loss do not lose out on the connectivity essential to contacting friends and family, calling for help in an emergency, or accessing employment opportunities. I've had the chance to meet with IPCTS providers and visit their call centers. I've spoken with dedicated call center employees, many of whom relayed stories of their own family members with hearing loss, and they pointed to them as their inspiration for entering this field of work. And I've heard from consumers who benefit from IPCT, IPCTS. Recognizing the significant role IPCTS plays in the hearing loss community means we should ensure the program remains available for those who need it. But both the record here and my own experience indicates that scarce program dollars may be supporting at least some calls for which the parties do not need captions. So I'm glad we're launching this proceeding to help ensure that limited funding continues to support calls for those Americans that rely on captions to communicate. In this respect, I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to seek comment on additional steps that could help identify and remedy potential abuse and misuse of the program. Among other things, we now seek comment on whether IPCTS providers should require or enable their employees to flag instances where the captioning capability is turned on and thus the call is being paid for out of the fund, but the callers are not relying on the captions to communicate. With respect to this and other potential reforms, it's important that we act now, given the trends we're seeing in the program. Support for IPCTS is projected to cost nearly $1 billion in 2018 alone, which is up from $400 million in just 2016. And while the costs of providing IPCTS have declined drastically over the past several years, the rates charged by providers have grown by a significant margin. And this trend is unsustainable. So I welcome today's decision to bring compensation levels for IPCTS providers down to a closer approximation of their costs. I agree with our decision to more clearly green light the use of automatic speech recognition technologies, which can be a more cost-effective and reliable way of generating captions. And I support Commissioner Riley's request to seek comment on other alternative technologies that might assist individuals with hearing loss without cost to the fund. 
Finally, I want to acknowledge my colleague's willingness to add a new section to the further notice that seeks comment on additional steps we might take to ensure call quality when IPCTS is used to dial 911. Given the often exigent circumstances present during such calls, I'm glad that we're now developing a record on whether there's more we should do to ensure reliable 911 access. So thank you to the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau for your work on the item. That's my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, functional equivalency has been at the very heart of our telecommunications relay service policies. Functional equivalency may sound like the kind of regulatory lingo only a lawyer could love. But for millions of Americans with hearing and speech impediments, it means they have the right and ability to pick up a phone, reach out and connect, and participate more fully in the world. In the United States, the ranks of the hard of hearing are actually growing. This country's baby boomers began to reach 65 in 2011. As a result, the total estimate of those with hearing loss nationwide is now about 50 million. And for those individuals with hearing difficulties, the FCC's Internet Protocol Caption Telephone Service, or IPCTS, can make a big difference. It allows those with some residual hearing to use their own voice to speak during a call, but then read captions on their device when the called party responds. This means people with hearing loss can do the things that so many of us take for granted. Picking up the phone and seeking emergency help, securing a job, making a doctor's appointment, following up with a child's teacher, and connecting with family and friends. But the IPCTS program is under stress. It is growing fast and it needs attention. It needs a smart pathway forward. For these reasons, this rulemaking is timely. But I think the approach here is backwards. It puts the cart before the horse by introducing automatic speech recognition into the IPCTS program before we address our most basic regulatory responsibilities. I believe it makes sense to include automatic speech recognition in our framework under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Technology has advanced and it may be possible for automated systems to substitute for traditional IPCTS, which requires human intervention through communications assistance. This is exciting. It may yield an experience for users that is comparable to older forms of IPCTS and deliver true functional equivalency under the law. But inexplicably, the FCC authorizes automatic speech recognition technology today, but puts off for the future figuring out at what rate providers will be compensated and what service quality standards hard of hearing users can expect. Can we acknowledge that if functional equivalency is our legal mandate, we should be doing these things right here and now at the same time that we authorize the service? Well, I support the outcome here. I believe our analysis comes up short. I concur. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Aldrich's presentation outlined well why IPCTS is an important service to those with hearing loss and why current trends surrounding IPCTS put this important service at risk. Now, several years ago, I invoked Stein's Law to describe the situation. Stein's Law holds that if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Herbert Stein, the law's progenitor, suggested that an unsustainable trend would end of its own accord. But when it comes to federally sponsored programs, an agency may be compelled by circumstance to make the trend stop. This is such a case. We must act to ensure the sustainability of IPCTS for the millions of Americans with hearing loss who depend on it. And that is exactly what we are doing here at long last. For example, we set interim IPCTS compensation rates that will bring those rates closer to average provider costs. This move will make IPCTS more cost effective and save the TRS fund nearly $400 million over the next two years. We also adopt rules to limit unnecessary IPCTS use. To preserve the service for those who need it, we need to reduce uh, the use of the service by those who do not. 
So we adopt a general prohibition on providing IC IPCTS to ineligible users. We establish rules to help avoid the costly generation of captions when the user only needs to turn up the volume on his or her IPCTS device to communicate effectively. And we require IPCTS providers to include notifications in their information materials to help prevent casual or inadvertent use of the service. To ensure that the service keeps up with the times, we also take an important step toward modernizing IPCTS in light of technological advances. Specifically, we allow service providers to use fully automated speech recognition, or ASR, to generate captions. And at the same time, we make clear that providers using ASR must meet the FCC's minimum TRS standards. Looking to the future, we seek public input on measures to improve the compensation, funding, and structure of the IPCTS program. And we ask for a comment on how to ensure service quality for IPCTS users. Now, stepping back from all of these details, we should always remember the bottom line on these reforms and proposals. We are aiming for an IPCTS framework that stretches scarce federal dollars as far as possible to meet the needs of Americans with hearing loss. This item would not have been possible without the work of the dedicated and talented FCC staff. I, too, want to thank the staff of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, the Enforcement Bureau, the Office of Managing Director, and the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis. And with that, we will call a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Approve in part, concur in part. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Concur. The chair votes to approve. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to you for the hard work. Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the eighth and final item on your agenda today will be presented by the Media Bureau and is entitled Least Commercial Access, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative. Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Ms. Carey, welcome to the floor, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Media Bureau presents a further notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks to update our least access rules which require cable operators to set aside channel capacity for commercial use by unaffiliated video programmers. The further notice, this further notice, is part of the Commission's um, effort to modernize our media regulations. Joining me at the table are Martha Heller, Steve Brokart, and Diana Sokolow. Diana will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this further notice of proposed rulemaking seeking to update the Commission's least access rules. The further notice first tentatively concludes that the Commission should vacate its 2008 least access order, which never went into effect. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit has stayed that order for a decade in conjunction with several judicial appeals. Separately, the Office of Management and Budget disapproved of the information collection requirements associated with the order, finding that they were not consistent with the Paperwork Reduction Act. Vacating the 2008 order would provide the Commission with a clean starting point from which to consider specific proposals to modify the leased access rules. Second, the further notice seeks input on the state of the leased access marketplace generally and it invites comment on ways to modernize the existing leased access rules. The further notice proposes to require cable operators to respond only to bona fide requests from prospective leased access programmers, as suggested by commenters in the media modernization proceeding. It also seeks comment on other suggested changes to the leased access rules, including extending the time frame for providing responses to leased access requests and permitting cable operators to require leased access programmers to pay a nominal application fee and or a deposit. Finally, the further notice seeks comment on proposals to modify our procedures for addressing leased access disputes. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the further notice of proposed rulemaking and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Riley. I want to submit my statement for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Beverly Hills Cop, <laughs> Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, Karate Kid, Police Academy. I haven't just leaked Commissioner Riley's DVR list. <laughs> These are actually all films that were released in 1984, the same year that Congress passed the least access provisions of the Communications Act that we take up today. While those films have now aged into classics, the same can't be said for their sequels. 
And unfortunately, you'll have to stick with me a little longer for this uh, tortured analogy, the FCC's attempt to update our least access rule has met a similarly notorious fate. Our 2008 least access order has been say, stayed by the Sixth Circuit for a decade. So I welcome the chance to launch this proceeding and take a fresh look at our approach. After all, I'm told by Commissioner O'Reilly that a lot has changed since 1984. I was five years old, so I'm taking oh. his word for it. Ouch. Uh, but there are statistics that back this up as well. Back then, cable accounted for 98% of the pay TV market. Now, over 99% of homes have access to at least three competing video providers. Satellite providers alone now have around 30% of all subscribers. And these figures don't account for the strong competition consumers are seeing from online streaming services like Sling, Netflix, and Amazon. Given these marketplace changes, I asked my colleagues to add a new section to the item that seeks comment on the First Amendment implications of our least access regime. With relatively lower barriers to distributing content, including through online platforms, and a greater number of distribution options, I'm interested in hearing from commenters about whether our approach remains consistent with the First Amendment. So I want to thank my colleagues for agreeing to seek comment on these issues. I look forward to reviewing the record as it develops, and I want to thank the Media Bureau for its work on the item. It has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly will have a chance to respond <laughs> later. Rosenworthel. We'll first go to Commissioner Rosenworcel then. Uh, in the interest of moving us along, I will submit a statement for the record and say uh, we are starting anew with least access, and I look forward to the record that develops. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Section 612 of the Communications Act requires cable operators to set aside channel capacity for commercial use by unaffiliated video programmers, a process that is commonly known as least access. The FCC's rules implementing this statutory provision have a muddled past, to say the least. The FCC last modifies it, its least access rules in 2008, but as Ms. Sokolov pointed out, its order never went into effect due to a judicial stay in the Sixth Circuit and the Office of Management and Budget's refusal to approve the new rules under the Paperwork Reduction Act. As a result, the least access rules currently in effect are the ones the FCC adopted almost a quarter century ago. So given this background, I'm pleased that we are proposing to vacate the troubled 2008 order and wipe the slate clean. In addition to beginning to turn the page on that order, we need to examine how to modernize our least access rules to fit the media marketplace of today not that of the early 1990s or 1984. And we're doing just that here, seeking input on the current state of the least access marketplace, including the impact of alternative means of video distribution that simply didn't exist when these rules were created. I look forward to reviewing the record and eventually updating our regulations as appropriate. As with all our modernization initiatives, the laurels belong to our dedicated staff. Thanks to the Media Bureau for the great work, along with the Office of General Counsel for the assistance. Uh, with that, we'll call for a vote on our last item. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Votes aye. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Approve. The chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? Yes. Uh, uh, All right. This, this, is, this is one where we're going to say goodbye to someone. LaShawn Pratt is sitting over there in the green and probably does not like all the attention I am trying to shower on her. It's not her mode to take praise publicly, but I want to let you know that she has been the elegant and authoritative presence at the front of my office since I returned to the agency. Her organizational skills are second to none she has kept our office running smoothly. She is grace under fire, knows how to operate under pressure, and is the consummate professional. We are really going to miss her as she moves on to a terrific new opportunity at the Small Business Administration. And I just wanted to acknowledge her service to my office and to this agency because it's been extraordinary. Thank you, LaShawn. up with the summer intern theme where we started, I want to introduce uh, three law clerks that are joining my office for the summer. Uh, they're sitting over here in the press row. Uh, we'll start with Constance Ricketts, and unfortunately, you got to stand up. That's part of the, <laughs> the whole regime here. 
She's a recent graduate of my alma mater, Catholic University, the Columbus School of Law, uh, where she got a certificate from the Institute for Communications Law Studies. While in school, Constance was an active board member of the Evening Law Student Association, the Women's Law Caucus, and Phi Alpha Delta Honors Law Fraternity. Constance earned an undergrad degree from the University of Maryland at College Park. Thanks for joining us. Uh, also is Elizabeth Fawson Brown. She's a 2L at George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law. She moved uh, to California actually from Norway uh, right after high school. She earned an undergrad degree in political science from California Lutheran University. And after graduating, uh, she intends to pursue a career in public service. So you get to see what it's about here. Thanks for joining us for the summer. Uh, and finally, uh, Connor Gleason, he's a 2L also at George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law, where he's vice president of the Communications Law Association. He earned his undergrad from LSU, and prior to law school, he served uh, on Capitol Hill for about two years uh, with Senator David Vitter's office, covering issues related to technology, telecom, and cybersecurity. After graduating, he also plans to continue his commitment to public service by pursuing a career in telecom policy. We're really glad to have you here and all three of you here for the summer. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Just a few announcements from me. Uh, first, I wanted to announce the departure of one of our uh, longstanding members from the International Bureau, Ann Gallagher, who was the chief of our cross-border and negotiations branch. Uh, this is a very important branch that is instrumental in the cross-border spectrum work that we do with our uh, neighbors in Canada and Mexico, including the incentive auction repack, which is, of course, a fundamental component of the incentive auction. Uh, I wanted to thank Anne uh, for her service to the commission. I had a chance to do this in person at the weekly cake party that the International Bureau holds. Uh, we wish her well in the future and uh, look forward to keeping up with her as she travels around the country and the world. I'd also like to take a minute this afternoon to introduce our offices to uh, summer interns. Uh, first, Justin McCune. He just completed his first year at the Marlene Dorch Institute for Advanced Educational Studies, which less commonly is known as Ohio State uh, College of Law. Uh, and in the fall, he'll be going back to law school and entering the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. Uh, Justin was born and raised in Dublin, Ohio, home of the Memorial Golf Tournament and the Dublin Irish Festival, uh, both of which he frequently volunteered for and attended, sober, as I understand it. Uh, Justin stayed close to home for college, studying political science and psychology at Ohio State. He's been active in local politics, working in the Ohio Senate and the Ohio Facilities uh, Construction Commission, or the OFCC, uh, throughout his undergraduate career. So he traded one FCC for another, and uh, this will be his longest stint ever outside of the Buckeye State. Uh, Justin, welcome aboard. You're, he's a Cleveland Cavaliers fan. He's had a hard time recovering from game one, of course, but he knows what the score is now, unlike some. But nevertheless, he's uh, looking forward to an enlightening summer here in DC with the real FCC. Uh, Kevin Costello just finished his first year at the University of California, Hastings College of Law. He's on the other end of the NBA spectrum. He's a Golden State Warriors fan, having grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he grew up in Concord, California specifically, and after turning 18, he thought, I've had enough of this nice weather and the laid back atmosphere. I want to go to upstate New York. And so he went to Colgate University, where he wandered the hills for four years studying philosophy and political science. After realizing perhaps that the Northeast uh, is chilly and that Walden is better as a book than as a guide for how to live, uh, he came back to the Bay Area after graduation where he worked at Yelp for a year before starting law school at Hastings. Uh, he entered law school with a very strong interest in tech and communications and during his first year, he happened to run into a fellow Hastings alum and former FCC commissioner, Rochelle Chong, who inspired his interest in these issues. Uh, she's a dear friend to many here and we are glad that she sparked that interest. Uh, we welcome each of them aboard and look forward to the great work they've done. Between the two of them, I'm pleased to say that I believe each of them knew three of the four Beatles, which is more than I can say <laughs> for most of his gener their generation. Uh, if my colleagues don't have any further announcements, oh, Sorry, Commissioner Riley. My deepest apologies. I didn't realize it was intern introduction day. <laughs> Let me take a, a moment to introduce our new intern. I won't make her stand because I don't think that's, I think that's punishment enough to just work before me. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Kaditz is, uh, did undergrad at Brandeis in Massachusetts where she was also president of the women's rugby. Uh, and now she is at the University of Colorado Law School and practicing uh, as part of our, our, our number of Snova folks out there at Silicon Flatirons. Uh, and she's gonna do wonderful work for us this summer and we're so pleased that she's with us for most of this uh, this season. Is she here? I said, 
She's here. Oh, we just, all right. Well, no one's standing, so I wasn't sure. Well, that, I don't punish my, my interns by making them stand. <laughs> but thank you for doing so. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, if there are no further announcements, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next date of the Commission's open meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, July 12, 2018. And with that, we stand adjourned. Hello, if everyone could please take your seats or your conversations outside, we're ready to get started. The chairman's going to be delivering an opening statement and is happy to take your questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chairman Pai. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pelkey. Uh, tonight, the Washington Capitals could win DC's first sports championship in 26 years. Coincidentally, uh, go caps, all caps, pick your hashtag. Uh, coincidentally, 26 years was the projected running time for today's meeting uh, after the white copy notice went out, but thanks to our early votes on four items and our, the commissioner's relative concision during the meeting, uh, the agenda was shorter than originally billed. Uh, but before taking your questions, I'd like to briefly highlight three items. First, we took our latest step to promote U.S. leadership in 5G and to deliver the next generation of wireless connectivity to the American people. In our latest initiative in the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding, we resolved some outstanding issues and finalized rules for the use of the 24 gigahertz band and made progress in the lower uh, 37 gigahertz band. We also proposed freeing up even more spectrum for flexible wireless use in both the 26 gigahertz and 42 gigahertz bands. Bottom line, the FCC is working to unleash even more spectrum that will help fuel the cons uh, mobile revolu revolution. Second, we are yet again uh, removing regulatory barriers to encourage the deployment of next generation networks and close the digital divide. And we approved an order that will make it easier for companies to discontinue outdated legacy services and transition to the networks of tomorrow. This regulatory streamlining will mean fewer resources going to prop up fading technology and more investment going toward the technologies of the future. Now, we not only want to cut red tape to lower the cost of broadband deployment, we also want to lower broadband prices for consumers. But by imposing harsher financial burdens on certain rural broadband providers, the FCC's Universal Service Fund rules were essentially levying a broadband tax that uh, got passed on to rural subscribers. Moments ago, we voted to relieve small rural carriers from this burden. Again, one that other carriers don't have to bear. Getting rid of this unfair broadband tax will mean cheaper broadband services for some rural consumers by up to $7 a month. Uh, so in the spirit of the Stanley Cup Finals, I'm calling this our digital opportunity hat trick. I, uh, and in closing, I will confess that I did enjoy the Las Vegas Knights Cinderella story. It's, it is a fantastic story after all. But I know a lot of people in this town love the Capitals a lot more. So once again, let's go Caps and let's open the floor for questions. Hey, Margaret McGill with Politico. Hello. Hey, I want to ask about the um, transparency requirements in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Sure. Uh, specifically, what incentive do companies have to file their net neutrality practices with the FCC? Why, sh why should they do that? And then also, if you can talk about what actions the agency might take to ensure that those disclosures are posted somewhere. Is it going to rely on complaints, or are you going to be more proactive on that front? Uh, thanks. So the first is uh, we, it was very important to us for consumers to be protected uh, through the FCC transparency rule. And that is why we require them to disclose a whole manner of uh, broadband business practices. Uh, they can do that through our portal. We've already set up a website, as you might be aware, uh, for those transparency disclosures. And they can also uh, post them on their own websites. And so going forward, um, in terms of the second question, we can be both reactive and proactive. Reactive in the sense that if consumers or others file complaints about inadequate disclosures, we can take a look at those complaints. And proactive in the sense that we will also monitor uh, those, uh, those disclosures to make sure that they are compliant with our rules. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what's your reaction to the news or the, the 
new attention on the fact that Facebook had a dating sharing agreement with Huawei, and in fact that other Silicon Valley companies have similar arrangements with uh, some of the Chinese manufacturers that people have expressed national security concerns about. We have monitored those uh, press reports, of course, but we don't have direct jurisdiction over that issue, and so that would uh, be more of a matter, I think, for other agencies, uh, such as the Federal Trade Commission, perhaps, to take a look at. Could the FCC look into it? Uh, again, here, our jurisdiction does not extend uh, to edge providers in that, um, in, with their, in that respect. John Reed Bloomberg. Uh, do you have any more details about the C-band item that the FCC will vote on in July? And what are your thoughts on the proposal from Intel SAT SES to free up 100 megahertz? Is that enough or is more needed? Uh, thanks for the question. Unfortunately, it's a bit premature. As I said, we are going to be voting on it in July, which working backwards uh, three weeks from the July meeting means we will be uh, disclosing the text of that uh, proposal pursuant to my transparency initiative on June uh, 20th, I think it is, or three weeks before the July meeting. What, I can't remember the specific date, June 20th or 21st. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, you'll be able to get the full uh, range of issues that we intend to tee up and uh, look forward to a productive discussion on July 20th, J July 10th. Great. Hi, Hi. Kelsey Griffiths with Law360. I was wondering if you could clarify how the uh, post millimeter wave spectrum auction uh, reviews would work and whether the new item is going to remove any kind of controls uh, before spectrum auctions. Sure, so in terms of the cap, uh, our decision was that a preemptive cap that um, applies before any auction has been held was the wrong approach, so uh, we adopted more of the case-by-case -case approach. And uh, I mean, essentially, we would apply it as uh, we have the screen that applies in other situations, so take a look at um, you know, what the holdings are and make a determination based on the facts and the, and the applicable law. So just a, more of a post hoc uh, case by case approach as opposed to a preemptive one size fits all approach. Great. Hi, I'm from Policy Tracker. It looks like there's a possibility that these UMF US licenses at 24 gigahertz, 37, and 39 gigahertz would be out of line with what the ITU is working on as part of WLC 19. Um, do you think it'd be realistic that the FCC would revise these licenses after WLC 19? Or would you seek to lobby so as to avoid um, the regu radio regulations not limiting it? Sorry, I couldn't catch the first part of your question. Sure. W could you see what? So, um, I, I got the, the predicate for it, uh, 24 gigahertz, but then you said... I mean, at 37 and 39 gigahertz as well, there's a similar, um, the TG51, I think, studies are trying to limit interference into, I believe it's um, uh, uh, radars of some sort. Anyway, so there's a possibility that um, the UMFUS licenses would be out of line. I was wondering what your general approach to resolving that problem, or if it is a problem, would be. Uh, so I guess a two-part answer. One is that we uh, want to uh, continue U.S. leadership in 5G, and that, uh, in our view at least, requires us to take a very proactive approach on fe freeing up as much spectrum as possible for the commercial marketplace. We want the U.S. to be a haven for innovation and investment, and that's part of the reason why we've teed up a multiplicity of bands, uh, including the ones you identified. At the same time, uh, we are engaged in uh, active preparations for uh, the Work 19 conference next year, and that involves us uh, making sure that uh, the rest of the world knows our position on some of these different spectrum bands, and also uh, making sure that we understand where some of the rest of the world is coming from. So for example, with 26 gigahertz, that's one of the reasons why uh, we are looking at that as well, because I know that the rest of the world has uh, expressed some interest in that. As, so um, again, it's always uh, you know, a balance, so we want to make sure that we are both conveying information and understanding other uh, countries and regions' positions. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. The uh, Obama-era internet rules expire on June 11th, following the vote by under your leadership for mm -hmm. this commission. Will Americans' access to and experience with the internet get better or worse, and, and why? It's going to get better. I think the light-touch market-based approach to which we are returning, which originally started in the Clinton administration and continued until 2015, will be a very successful one going forward. It's going to mean better, faster, cheaper internet access for American consumers and more competition. I, I'll just give you a couple of vignettes, for example. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Georgia, and I met with the uh, owner of Paladin Wireless, a small wireless company started by an IT professional who was dissatisfied with the internet options where he was living in Royston, Georgia, a very tiny town in Georgia. So he started up a wireless internet service provider. And he told me that these regulations required him to divert $8,000 almost, 7,800 to be specific, away from network construction and toward a compliance and the other uh, type of regulatory work that was required under these rules. $8,000 may not sound like a lot to many people, but in a, a small town like Royston, Georgia, 
it's many households that could have been connected with a fixed wireless connection that they wouldn't have otherwise had. I've heard the same thing from uh, Lorenz Municipal Utilities in Lorenz, Iowa. A company called Vermontel or VTEL recently submitted a letter uh, CCing uh, me and others at the commission pointing out that they, thanks to the new regulatory approach from this FCC, including the repeal of the Obama era utility style regulations on the internet, they're now going to pour $4 million into upgrading uh, their 4G LTE networks and investing more on the overall internet experience. And so when I travel around the country, as I suggested in the predicate to my wireline infrastructure statement, what I hear is that people want better, faster, cheaper internet access. They want competition. These rules took us in the opposite direction from that. And the repeal of those rules, uh, you know, uh, you know, the consumer protection provision uh, here at the FCC in terms of transparency, the anti-competitive authority the FTC has to guard against conduct from any provider in the internet economy will preserve the free and open internet that we all cherish and promote the massive infrastructure investment that is necessary for us to be able to claim the benefits of the digital revolution, both mobile and fixed. No Step Brothers questions, all right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, June. At this point, we'll hand things over to Mark Whitfield for the Bureau Press Conference. Okay, as usual, we'll just go through the, uh, the different items and, and see if there's questions for those items. Um, so are there any questions on the first item, the Spectrum Frontiers item? Okay, we have one, wireless. And OET. Go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, from Policy Tracker. Can you hear me up there? Yeah, I guess you can. Speak a little louder. Ah, uh, hi. Yeah. Ah, there you go. I'm up. fine now. Um, I'm from Policy Track, and my question is simple, really. If there's any change in the new document that went out in comparison to the one that was circulated um, in May, and what those changes are, if, if there's a way of summarizing it now verbally. Is it, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we'll be releasing the new document soon, and we'll, we'll just refer, refer you to that. I mean, I, I don't think there's been anything particularly you know, of great significance that's changed, but um, but it'll be out soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anything further? No, no, not not really. I just wanted to know there's like a substantive difference. You know, as a result of a comment from a commission or something like that. But but no. So. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Okay. The next uh, three items are all wireline items um, for the accelerating wa uh, the wireline infrastructure. Any for that? Rural broadband. Any for that? And finally, the toll-free access reform. I'm sorry, the next four items. Toll-free access reform, and then text-enabled toll-free numbers. Okay, none. Uh, move on to CGB, cramming and slamming. Any on the cramming and slamming items? Okay. Um, CGB also, IPCTS. Okay, no questions. And finally, Media Bureau Least Access. Okay, apparently not. Uh, I, let me, I don't see commissioners yet, but maybe they're on the way. They are here, so the commissioners will now begin their portion of the press conference. Thank you. make ourselves available for questions if anyone may have some today. How can we help? Hi, Kelsey Griffiths with Law360. I wanted to see if you could um, go over where some of these per household um, savings numbers came from in the USF forbearance item. Yeah, I think it's yeah. So if you look at some of the petitions that were filed, they would talk about uh, the total savings among their uh, contribution base. And these are, you know, line items that are on customers' bills. And so there was information in the petitions themselves that you can go back and look at that uh, put some of those figures into the record. Okay, so they're not necessarily FCC-generated figures. Right. My understanding, these are all numbers that have been, uh, you know, either put in the record or otherwise come from the providers themselves about what would be showing up on a consumer's bill today and then hopefully wouldn't be, you know, once we 
getting just one through it. Uh, hi, uh, my question is about the 26 gigahertz band. I understand that Lockheed Martin have um, submitted a petition to use it for high altitude platform uh, systems or something like this. And so they want to try and share the spectrum and it may result in a reduction of that band's availability for 5G. And I was wondering what your um, approach would be. Because I understand that they were asking to actually remove 26 gigahertz from the, um, uh, the consultation document that went out today. Uh, I did meet with them and, and they did make their request. I don't think that um, our item today matched up with their request and I think they're looking at other bands as well. Uh, gentlemen, do you share Commissioner Rosenworcel's fear that the reform to um, the toll-free calling that item might, might eliminate toll-free calls? Uh, I, I do not to share her, her view on that. I think it's uh, premature in terms of where the item may go. I also think that toll-free calling is kind of uh, something that is, is decreasing overall. So I'm not uh, as worried as she may be. So it sounds like uh, suggestions of a national 5G network have emerged again. Uh, is there anything we should be looking for out of the FCC? And is that something that you expect you might have to deal with in the future? I think my comments on this are well known, uh, and, I'll, <laughs> and, and I'll just Who's leave it. You, uh, Margaret McGill on this issue. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll just say I think all five commissioners have put out statements uh, when we had five commissioners on this issue, and for my my part at least, I'll just refer you back to my statement on it. Uh, hi, uh, um, O'Reilly. You uh, received a reply to your letter from the CEO of Toyota about the 5.9 gigahertz band. And he said that Wi-Fi usage of that band would have to be set up so it wouldn't interfere with DSRC. Do you share that understanding going forwards? Uh, say that the, he, he thinks that what? Well, from what I understood from his letter, he replied to your letter that you signed with Rosenworcel to, to him. Um, and what he was saying was that uh, they would want to continue having access to 5.9 gigahertz for the um, ITS, DSRC um, program. And his understanding was that if there were one license to use the band going forwards, it would be on a way that would not interfere with DSRC. So the term is harmful interference, not interference. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are, you know, working through that process as part of our testing regime. We finished phase one. We have phase two, phase three. You're still working uh, to start and initiate, the, hopefully as soon as possible. Uh, that is one mechanism that, that he spoke about is, is how do you do that? There's also been ideas about rebanding the, the, the mechanism, rebanding 5.9 uh, and moving and shrinking the spectrum so you may have a different uh, allocation uh, issue. Uh, there's also been uh, the development of a new tech, you know, new uh, platform, uh, yeah. CV2X, that's operational and, and, and testing to, to be operational in the future. Um, so we have to consider all of those things. Uh, I think that it's, it's imperative on the commission to consider the changes in the marketplace, both in terms of technology that has developed to compete with many of the services that were once uh, envisioned by DSRC, uh, but also reflect that we have a new provider and the possibility, um, quite possible, uh, that we can have unlicensed uh, service in that, that band. So I, I'd like to see the commission uh, be very active in that space, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Hey, Margaret McGill with Politico. Um, one for Commissioner O'Reilly. I was hoping you can give us an update on where the, um, the your review of the KIVID regulation stands, and if you think that will be, you'll be making any recommendations in the timeline for that. We continue to process the topic, uh, and the the agenda the scheduling is all up to the chairman. So we're working through that, and hopefully we'll be uh, approaching something soon. Okay, and for Commissioner, sorry, just one for Commissioner Carr. Uh, similar question, only about um, uh, infrastructure siting. I know you've been working on that for a while. When do you think we can expect the next uh, proposal so this summer, maybe? Yeah, we've been working through these issues. I'll actually be up in uh, Boston tomorrow uh, at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, having some discussions on a lot of these topics as well. Looking forward to obviously hearing from that important stakeholder group and learning some lessons from them. I've also meeting with city planners and county commissioners that have traveled around the country. This is all feeding into um, you know, the cuts that we're working through right now, but nothing definitive right now in terms of specific timing. Commissioner Carr, you had indicated you said there, uh, that there were First Amendment issues that were brought to the least access item that, that you had suggested. 
Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more? And if it turns out that there are comments that indicate there are First Amendment issues with this, are you, is this something thus you'll be looking to, to rescind these least access rules overall? So historically, uh, if you look back, there have been uh, First Amendment issues raised with respect to our lease access regime. Some have been litigated and decided. And my point is simply that since the factual basis and the specifics that were before the courts and the FCC back then, as you run through the First Amendment analysis, they've changed significantly since then. Perhaps they come out the same way. Perhaps they come out a different way. Uh, I have an open mind as to it. I just want to make sure that given the changes since we last looked at it, Let's take a look at these as well through the First Amendment filter and make sure we're still acting consistent with that. But I don't have a particular outcome in mind right now. I hope to learn more about it from the record. Okay, but it's a, it's a marketplace analysis, but through a, a First Amendment filter is what you're talking about, looking at how the, the sort of the media marketplace has changed. Yeah, there are elements about speech and speech restrictions and rules that touch on speech uh, that can sometimes depend on the nature of the market and alternative mechanisms you know, once you run through the First Amendment analysis, and it's just making sure we get a record on that so that we can run that through whenever or if ever we reach another decision in this proceeding. Uh, sorry to come back to USF forbearance one more time. Since I am not a technologist by any stretch, can you clarify the types of small rural providers that were paying these services? I'm guessing that that means they were maybe like dial-up type service over copper networks, is that correct? Well, I'd say many of them are members of the NTCA, uh, and I, in terms of the specific service, I'm happy to follow up with you on that. Yeah, they do tend to be smaller providers, more rural providers, and um, there's some unique reasons why the, their broadband offering is classified as Title II to give them access to um, other types of things, pooling arrangements and other issues. So there's some quirks as to why their retail broadband has been a Title II service. Uh, and it's those providers and their unique situations that we're addressing with this order. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, we will leave. No questions, anyone last questions? Mr. Donnelly. All right, and then there was one. Margaret. Yes. Um, sorry, it's okay. Um, Margaret McGill with Politico. I want to ask, uh, with the restoring internet freedom order taking effect next week, there's this ISP transparency portal. I want to get your thoughts on how useful you think that will be for consumers. I think this commission made a serious error when it rolled back our net neutrality policies Consumers like them, courts approved them, and we've got an angry public out there that is still writing my office and this agency furious with what my colleagues did late last year. Transparency is important, it's good, it needs to be a part of the solution, but it is not everything. Because now our carriers have the legal right to block websites, to throttle services, and censor online content. They only have to be transparent about their ability to do so. I don't think making clear that they're willing to muck around with our traffic in the fine print is all that liberating for consumers who want the internet to stay open and free. Hi, Hi. Kelsey Griffiths with Law360. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more um, about how the USF contribution base could be expanded um, even as um, some of that revenue is shrinking. Well, that's something that's really in the first instance up to the chair of the federal state joint board. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly is at the helm of that, so I think you should probably speak to him. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Toby from Policy Tracker. Following on from what Commissioner O'Reilly was saying, would you also want to see the commission being active on 5.9 gigahertz, possibly moving or shrinking spectrum to be made available for DSRC? Commissioner O'Reilly and I have worked together now for several years on trying to identify how we can simultaneously put the 5.9 gigahertz band to use for public safety purposes associated with DSRC and more unlicensed service. Remember, this band was allocated two decades ago for what we then thought was going to be a widely used traffic safety system. 
But today, the NTSB says it will take another 30 years before DSRC is available in the majority of cars on the road. That's half a century worth of commitment to DSRC. I think that that's extraordinary because Spectrum policy is moving fast. So it's incumbent on this agency to think in a modern way about how to put this resource to use. And that's what we're doing with our ongoing testing to identify how we can simultaneously accommodate the safety elements of DSRC and more Wi-Fi in this band. Um, hi, Commissioner Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. Following up on, on Margaret's question, but with a consumer focus, uh, when the rules expire June 11th, next Monday, how will consumers' experience with the internet change? Will it get better, will it get worse? And I'll leave it at that. Please go ahead. I don't think anything gets better for consumers with the rollback of these rules. Consumers want an open internet. They don't want their broadband providers blocking websites or censoring content. And this agency gave broadband providers the legal right to do so. I think that's crazy, I think that's misguided, and I know a lot of the American public agree with me. We've got 23 state attorneys general suing this agency. We've got more than 100 mayors across the country who've signed on to a net neutrality pledge. We've got five different executive orders from governors around the country committing to net neutrality. We've got laws in state houses and laws that have been passed in state houses. We've had a congressional resolution in the United States Senate that's an extraordinary amount of activity. People are angry about what this agency did, and I think they made a grievous mistake. I don't think it gets better for consumers until we fix this and once again make net neutrality the law of the land. Hi, uh, I just wanted to see if there is anything more you could tell us about your incoming colleague, Jeffrey Starks, and about some of the issues you look forward to working with him on. Well, I'm the only Democrat here right now, so I can't wait until he joins us. I look forward to that day, and I hope it's in the near future. All right. Anything else? I think a late lunch is in order. Thanks. Okay.